Well, welcome. Hello, Marianne. So, Hello, Katja. So, so happy to have you on this call today. I'm, I'm really, really grateful and excited. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know Marianne, Marianne is a very dear friend of mine. We've known each other for 20 years and I can say that I owe Marianne a lot of who I've become as a human being and a woman in this world. Marie, Marianne is an intuitive therapist. She holds a master's degree in social work and in her work with people, she uses her intuitive abilities to help people, accompany people of all ages, in all yeah, places. And also, of course, people that are not born yet, which we will talk about later. And also people who are ready to move on to the next plane. So Marianne, what I would love to hear from you because your story is such a unique story and which is what qualifies you um, to talk about the work that you do the best, you know, the most that I can imagine because you have had such an incredible experience in life that not many people can, can say. So I would love to, can you share more about it? Thank you. Yes, I'd love to. Uh, when I got my master's degree, I was on fire to change the world. I'm a Sagittarian. I'm passionate about everything good on the planet. I was ready to oh, just do so much. And uh, a few months after I did that, I got the degree. I was walking home in a blizzard in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I was hit by a car that was trying to get up a hill on the ice. And all of those dreams were shattered from that point on, not because I was had broken bones or anything like that. Actually, it was amazing. Nothing really happened to me in the accident, except for the fact the day after I became very, very nauseous and couldn't eat. This went on for almost a year, and my weight dropped to under 70 pounds or 32 kilos. I was walking home one night from my work, and... I started to cry and I just walked into a health food store and said, do you have anything that will help me? And I could see the man look at me with shock. And he said, you must go see Paula Davy. She's a doctor and she specializes in allergies. And I said, no, no, I don't have allergies. I'm not sneezing. I said, I can't eat. And he looked at me and said, you must see Dr. Davy. So I went to see Dr. Davy, and I sat with her three hours, and she asked me, how do you feel when you polish your nails? How do you feel when you fill your car with gas or petrol? The questions went on and on. I thought she was kind of crazy. And at the end, she looked at me and said, Miss Kentz, that was my maiden name, you are exquisitely sensitive to petrochemicals, and you are hopelessly allergic to milk and wheat. And I said to her, that's not possible. The only thing I can eat is a little bit of yogurt and toast. And she glared at me and said, that's why I know you're so allergic. So she told me to rip up my carpet, quit my job, throw out my clothes, only get cotton clothing, throw out all my cosmetics, throw out uh, laundry, soap, everything. I came home, I thought she was, and she said, eat asparagus. I came home, told my friend who was there waiting for the news, we both agreed she was nuts. What the hell did my carpet have to do with my not eating? I did nothing, she said, nothing at all. Long story short, about six months later, I was fighting for my life mm -hmm. back in the hospital and in a room with a big sign on the door, do not come in this room if you are wearing deodorant, perfume, blah, 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 blah. And I just lay there in the fetal position weighing 32 kilos for a month. Finally, I got strong enough to go home. And she said, you can't go home unless the gas stove is taken out of your house and the carpet's ripped up. A friend did both of those things for me. I came home and I gained five kilos in a week. And I finally got it, that people can be profoundly affected by the petrochemicals that have been introduced into the world since World War II into the, in the water and in the air and in the food. And I was one of those people. 
Wow. That's, uh, I mean, I, I know, like, I know your story because I read your book. So I know this is, was just the beginning of what happened next. Can you, can you talk a little bit more about? Yeah. Um, I did what she said. I was like St. Paul on the road to Damascus. I saw the light. No, I did everything. I started to preach to everybody, get rid of your gas stove. I think people were like, oh my God, she's mental. Do you have a gas stove? You shouldn't have a gas stove. I was telling everybody all this stuff. I was a convert, no question about it. And I started to get better. But in the middle of win the winter came and in Michigan, everybody has a furnace downstairs and it pumps oil fired heat into the house. And I immediately went downhill. And she found a home for me to go to that was electrically heated. I was able to go there at eight o'clock every night and sleep on the laundry room floor. I would leave at eight o'clock the next morning. I would get 12 hours of none of that heat. And then I spent the day just walking. I just walked everywhere. I didn't go back. I went into my house to the bathroom and kept walking. So it was a hard existence, but it was what had to be done. Again, I'm jumping a few steps, but I finally about a year later was well enough to move into an electrically heated apartment of my own. I started to feel good and I started to eat one teaspoon, tablespoon of ice cream a day. I figured it won't hurt because my diet had been very, 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 very restricted. It was one food a day. It came in from Africa on dry ice. That was my life. So I have, have, Make sure your audience knows I wasn't cheating because it was an extremely restricted diet. So I figured I'm fine now. I'll have just a tablespoon of ice cream a day. That was the worst thing I could have done. I should have had a bowl one day, not had anything for 14 days, and I probably would have been okay. But it was the everyday exposure to the dairy. So I went down. I mean, down. And I went to see her. I, I told her the truth. I can't be outside. The air pollution is bothering me. She was an incredible woman. She saved my life. I wouldn't be talking to you today without her. And she just told me the truth. You're not going to survive unless you live in a bubble. So I was 27 when I entered the bubble. And it was a room with nothing except three wooden chairs and a lamp. So I sat there. I couldn't read my own mail. I couldn't touch a pen, paper, phone, books. I didn't see books for years. I just sat on the chair. And at night, I pushed the three chairs together and lay on them. It was in there nine months to the day. And that's when my world changed. It was nine months of watching everything and trying to understand why I couldn't be in all this chemical stuff and my friends could be out there having a great time. What was it about me that was making me so susceptible? And the turning point came one day when I was going to the bathroom, which was right across the bubble, and I knew exactly how to do it. I would take a big breath, hold my breath. I could last long enough in the bathroom, even to take a five second, 10 second shower, I could still get out having held my breath because if I took a breath, I would have pain from the fiberglass bathtub, etc. So I knew how to do this. I was good at holding my breath about more than a minute and getting everything done and getting out. This day I went, put my hand on the doorknob to go out and I got the pain. I got the chemical pain. I said, what the hell is the matter with me? I'm not in the bathroom. I know I'll be fine if I hold my breath. Why do I have this pain now? I said, I'm going to try it again. So I put my hand slowly up, went to the doorknob, I got the pain again. So I'm going to try it one more time. I went one more time and I said, I'm scared. I said, what am I scared of? I know I'll be fine in the bathroom for one minute. I said, I'm scared of life. I'm scared of being alive. I don't want to go out of this bubble. That was the beginning of the healing. That was the beginning of the, and I'm still healing. I'm not normal by any means. But that was the turning point when I recognized, oh, my goodness, this isn't just about a pesticide. This is about a great, great fear of being alive. Wow. You know, every time I listen to your story, I just find myself so speechless because it, it is really some 
an experience you've gone through that most of us, you know, people listening to you, most of my you know, audience wouldn't be able to imagine, you know, what it would be like to be so, so sensitive. And yet I do believe that if that what you're speaking to and about affects all of us, maybe to a lesser degree. But oh, yes, I listened to a, store, a doctor speak about chemical sensitivity last night. His whole patient, his whole patient group is chemically sensitive. And it is estimated one out of four in the Western world are reacting to chemicals. I just want to make sure so your audience understands. Generally speaking, they will not see cause and effect. In other words, they won't uh, pick up a plastic and smell it and have a reaction. The problem is that those reactions are masked, M-A-S-K-E-D, they're masked because the body is so overloaded by the toxins today. Anybody who subscribes to natural health stuff will see that probably uh, eight out of 10 webinars, symposiums, docu-series are about detoxification. First time in history, it's finally being acknowledged. People are overloaded by the petrochemicals in the air, food, and water. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very real. Um, and equally real is the mind-body connection. Right. This is equally real. And when I wrote, wrote my first book, uh, people got mad at me. Chemically sensitive people got mad at me. They said, you should have blamed chemicals more. No, we can never look at illness in the body without looking at it from the whole person point of view. We can't just look at the physical. We have to look at the emotional, the mental, and the relationship to spirit. So I was very pleased that my book said, yes, chemicals, glyphosate is terrible, but we also have to look at these other things. And I can tell you, Kazia, if I had not looked at my fear of life, I would still be in the bubble. Right. And this is, you know, this leads me to like, my second question to you because people here meet always talk about embodiment that's my big big passion and and it you know it's thanks to you that i kind of understand what that means because you helped me in many many sessions that we had together to understand what that actually feels like right what what oh i'm in my body i can feel my legs feels like rather than oh you know i'm disconnected from my body and I think that's normal because that's all I've known all my life right mm -hmm. and so my my question is I always find it hard to define what embodiment is and most people hear the word they might feel a resonance to it but they go what does it actually mean and so I don't know any other person that would be mo more most suitable to talk about it like what does the mind-body connection mean to you what does embodiment mean to you I define it as awareness or attention. They're the same thing. Being able to rest in the tissue of the body. And when that happens, there is perception and there is sentience. Sentience means feeling. To put that in a very simple way, the person who's disembodied can look absolutely alive and present and everything, but they don't feel themselves in their body while they look like that. Right. So it's a more robotic way of living. Uh, and it's determined by will. The disembodied person is willing themselves all the time to look like they're here, as opposed to attention being able to go right into the tissue and creating a sense when you move, this is my arm, this is my leg, this is me talking. The disembodied person does not have that sense of this is me. They have a sense of I know what I'm presenting to the world, but I don't feel it in my body as me. Right. This is so, this is so interesting. And I find it so mm, also fascinating because my own experience, right? Like what you say, I had no idea how disembodied I was and until the moment that I started working with you. And I remember very clearly that one moment when my body opened up and I felt energy shooting down my legs and it was accelerating. It was like, oh my God, I have legs, I have legs. I was crying with joy. 
But up till that moment, I hadn't even noticed that I was disconnected, right? And so from what you're sharing about your story, the fear of life that you experienced that disconnected you from your body, right? So you had the same experience and, and I guess many people do and they don't even know. And now, yeah, can you speak a little bit to that? Like how, because people can talk about embodiment, they can read books about embodiment, but unless they've experienced it, you know, it becomes still something that's limited to the cognitive realm to the intellect and how do we know the difference like how well i i i would say uh, a, a wonderful little experiment is to just look in a mirror at your own eyes now i i noticed my eyes this morning i've worked really hard <clears throat> i mean i really have given it my all this lifetime i'm 71 I was hit by the car at 25. I've had to work pretty much every day to, to hold together and to heal. Um, my eyes still show the effect of early life trauma. One eye looks terrified and the other eye looks vacant, like there's nothing happening. So the eyes can say a lot. If you look at your eyes and you see there's a vacant quality, you could say a frozen quality or there's nothing happening. That's one indicator. Then I ask my clients, I ask them, do you relate to the phrase lights on, but no one home? Or do you relate to the image of you sitting back in a director's chair and you're telling yourself what to do on the stage of life? I have never had one client not be able to quickly say, I'm in the director's chair, or it's lights on, no one home. They get it. When somebody points out to them, there's a possibility, when somebody invites them to consider it, they get it like that. Yeah, I'm in the director's chair. I'm not there. I'm telling myself what to do. Or I look very animated and I look so engaged, but I'm not really there. I'm too scared to be there. So those are two simple things. Then, of course, the person who's interested can go on and read several books about this, including the origin of the pattern. And I do want to I do want to make a distinction. Today, embodiment, it's it's a buzzword. It's talked about by lots of people. And one of the reasons is a lot of people in the Western world are in their thinking mind all the time. Think, 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 think. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they are disembodied in the way I have been. Yeah. In other words, we have trauma-related disembodiment, and we have what you might call societal patterning disembodiment. In the latter case, if I connect with that client, yes, I'll see that they're talking a lot. But if I say, take a few breaths and come down in your body, breathe down into your legs, I can see they have no problem getting down. They're like, yeah. And then they'll say something like, yeah, I think too much. But they can come in and feel their bodies. In the other case, I'll say, do you ever feel like you're not all here? And they'll sometimes start to cry. And they'll say, yes, that's trauma-related disembodiment, which is different than just society telling you, think, 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 think. So it's very, very important because we don't want everybody who thinks a lot to think they have trauma-related disembodiment. That is only a category that generally speaking, you can never say absolutely, but generally speaking happens um, as a result of trauma before birth or during birth or soon after. Yeah. Is that clear? Yeah, you know, absolutely. absolutely. The, the, the thing that comes up for me is like, you know, in my work, I've and with my friends and the people around me, I come to this almost, um, conclusion that everyone is traumatized to some degree you know so that like to, to find someone that is truly embodied not just oh i'm having a day where i'm busy in my head mm -hmm. but there's truly i can really fully feel it's very rare today yeah today but when you see them you can spot them right away i'm thinking of two or three p.m but i'll say to Corey, god that person's embodied he goes yeah i know first of all the eyes give away a lot you if you look at the eyes you see energy coming right out of the eyes to you 
Yeah. Not just the person trying to look like they're with you, but just I'm there and I'm not going anywhere. So they are, they're not as many as we'd like on the planet, which is why I'm so passionate about helping babies before birth. Because if we can interrupt that trauma response before they're born, we have the chance of preventing people ending up like me. Wow. So that's a great next question. But before we talk about that, I would actually like to maybe um, give the audience a little bit of an understanding of what happened to you while you were healing, you know, for the last 50 years, right? I mean, because you've developed an incredible gift that I have never, I mean, I've, I've, I've met many healers, I've met many medicine women and, and alternative practitioners, and I've never met anyone with such a profound gift of intuition that you have. And, but I also understand that some people will find it difficult to understand, yeah, to believe that or to understand what it is that you do. Mm -hmm. So could you speak about that? Well, <laughs> it definitely landed in my lap. I mean, I wasn't, oh my God, the last thing in the world I wanted to be was an intuitive healer. I had images of being a CEO of a company that heals world famine or something. <laughs> Great visions of myself. <clears throat> but I, I was dying. You know, my husband looked at me and said, we're in the middle of nowhere. You're in a room with a rug, uh, one wool blanket, and you're dying. And he said, we've got to figure out how to keep you alive. And at that point, three good friends of mine called all within two or three days. And they said, you've got to see this healer. She's a psychic healer. I said, I don't need a psychic healer. I know what's the matter with me. I'm environmentally ill. You've got to see her. And they were all quite, you know, pushy. You've got to see her. Corey said, "Hun, if three people called you, we better pay attention. So we drove to this woman and I sat down in front of her. I, and she said, what's the matter? And I said, I'm not well. And um, she said, I've never met anyone in my life who's had such a who has such a longing to have a child. And I burst into tears. I didn't even know. How did she know this? You know, I literally just sat down on the rug in front of her. So that naturally, I was like, "How do you do this kind of thing?" And uh, then she got very fiery with me. I don't remember much other than she got very fiery. And she said, you've been given a gift and you're wasting it. And I didn't know what she was talking about. I, I felt like saying, don't you get it? I'm half dead. I don't, I, I don't have gifts. I'm half dead. You know, <laughs> why did I come here? And my husband, and she said, you're very sensitive. And my husband <laughs> said, excuse me, would you mind not using that word? She gets very upset when she hears that word. She's been called the most sensitive person, blah, blah, blah. And then she yells at my husband. She said, she's been given a gift with her sensitivity and she's throwing it away. So we were at this point, both of us terrified. We're sitting like, we don't want to say any more words because we don't want her to yell at us anymore. And she said, do you want me to train you how to use this? I had absolutely no idea, excuse my language, what the fuck she was talking about, seriously. When she said, do you want me to train you? I didn't know, but I said, oh, yes, yes, yes. So we got out in the car and my husband said, hon, do you really want to be trained in this? I said, I don't even know what she's talking about, Court. But I said, if she thinks there's some way I can, I'm about to cry. If she thinks there's some way that I can do something on this earth, rather than just sit in a room, hoping to God, nothing gets near me. If there's something she thinks I can do, well, I might as well learn what it is. And he said, good, okay, let's come back. So we came back. She said, come with a photo of a person who's been sick. I called my mother. My nephew wasn't well. I said, mom, send me the photo fast. She said, nobody knows what's the matter with him. As it turns out, he was chemically sensitive, just like me. I came with the photo. I showed her the photo. And she said, um, so tell me what's the matter with him. It's very polite. I said, I, I, I'm sorry, but nobody knows what's the matter with him. That's the problem. She said, you tell me what's the matter with him. I said, I don't know what's the matter with him. And she yelled, literally, open up your chakras and tell me what's the matter with him. This is exactly what I did. I, I was terrified of this woman. So I said to myself, I know there's a chakra at the bottom and I know there's one at the top. 
So would those two open up and anything else that's in between, would those open up too? And she said, now pick up the photo. And I picked up the photo and I said, oh, oh my God, his glands, oh God, in here. Oh, this is so tight. I mean, I had every symptom that kid had, I had it in my body. And she said, now, are you getting this? You've done it your whole life. Take on everyone else's pain. If you want to get well, you have to learn how to use this sensitivity to help someone else. That was it. Wow. <laughs> Fierce grace, hi. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> so that would be the dis description and definition of an empath. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. You know, not compassion is a lovely woman who teaches about compassion talks. Compassion is that, of course, that heart open response. The empath says, I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it. So and uh, I'm, I'm convinced one of the reasons I did it, because I did. I had a partner years ago who says, said to me, every time you see, see something sad, you almost fall over. Why do you do that? And I, I began to see why I did that, because I was trying so hard to feel connected. I felt so utterly cut off from everything that if I at least felt someone's pain, there was a connection. Wow. I was trying to do that. And I was getting sicker all the time. And of course, my poor mother, it was 1950. My mother didn't know what to do. And, and she tells me, I would look across the room and I'd say, why is that person so mad at their father? And she'd say, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't even know the person. I said, but they're so mad at their father. She said, Marianne, it's not true. It was true. But my poor mother, I don't blame her. What do you do with a child who starts talking like that? Right. <laughs> well, you send them to a psychiatrist at 16, which is what she did. <laughs> okay, and probably give them some drugs, right? Like some. Well, I didn't, thank God I didn't get any drugs. I just talked, he smoked a cigar, and I just kept talking. I don't think it did a damn thing. But my mother and father felt that well, at least they were trying to help me. Wow. Well, what a story, because then, of course, as a young person you end up utterly confused alone because no one understands no one feels what you feel no one sees what you see you feel completely gaslit by all of yeah, I mean but I have to give the guy credit all he did was smoke this scar he didn't say anything but you know I didn't get any understanding of what was happening and I don't fault anyone it was the 1950s but, you know it was a very different era than now now I have people calling me who are saying, well, I'm pregnant. I want to make sure that some of my suffering doesn't go to my child. That's how far we've come. People are working hard to make sure their pregnant ch uh, their children in utero are okay. So, you know, I don't fault anybody in the 50s, but the bottom line is by the time I was hit by the car, I had no idea who I was. Wow. Wow, so fast forward all those years ahead now you're working like you've you've literally learned what that woman was trying to teach you and what i to my humble opinion you're quite masterful at it um being able to feel very much on the cellular level of what's happening inside a person's body and i've experienced that many times i remember the first time we worked together and you said to me you literally spoke to the deepest part of me that was felt very alone and abandoned and I hadn't known like I I mean that part was there but because it was never named it was never claimed it was completely in my subconscious but the moment that you spoke it out loud I remember my body my tissue just opening up and crying very much the same way as that woman looked at you and said I've never met anyone with a longing for a child so strong and you started crying and um, just being felt by another on that deepest level was so healing because all of a sudden I didn't feel so alone so yeah hmm. so I went to take it from here because I feel like there's a thousand different um, things we can talk about could I, could I add yeah, on one please. thing to that? Yeah. It's, I think uh, there are two things I'm 
great, very grateful about one that I went to see Riva, but two, I've never been particularly amazed about this gift. Uh, I, it isn't that I don't use it as a way to feel like I'm special at all. I never have. For me, it is just flipping a switch. If I want to know what's going on in someone's body in front of me, I just flip the switch. I never, ever do that. I only do it in the context of a session, but I'm capable of doing that. So I must treat that gift with great integrity, which I do. I don't read people in the street or anything like that. But because there is, and I, and I will say that, I'm not the type of person that praises yourself easily, but I would say there's a certain humility around the gift. There's not any kind of self aggrandization Oh, I'm a real wonderful intuitive. I, there's a humility because I understand one thing. My gift doesn't heal anybody. Information doesn't even heal anybody. An intuitive can go, you've got this and this and you've got your anger at your father. And it doesn't heal anybody. It doesn't get the cell to expand. And that's what healing is. Taking the cell from a contracted place and inviting it to expand. So my gift doesn't automatically do that. Information doesn't automatically do it. Intimacy doesn't. My clients need to feel I'm right there. That's what allows them to hear the words and allow them to go in. That's what allows that. And that Reva, even though she was very strong with me, I could feel her right with me. So when she said, I've never met anyone with such a longing for a child, I immediately started crying because I felt her with me. The words themselves didn't do it. It was the connection that allowed the words to have the impact. So that's the priority. And I have seen in the field of intuition healing, some people don't quite get it, that it's the intimacy that heals, not the information. Because you can babble on all you want. I'm in your throat. I feel a lot of anger. Oh, you better work with this. Oh, you better. That, that. that won't necessarily invite the tissue to open. Why? Because the person doesn't feel you're with them. They're just getting a lot of information. The other final thing I'd say about it is one thing I can say about myself, because it is, it is just the truth. I have had to look at such depths of insanity in myself. I really have had to. It's, 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 it's really, really the truth. I've had to look at all kinds of things that feed together hatred, rage, murderous rage. I've had to look at all of that just to be able to have clothing on my back and not be in pain. One of my biggest issues is lying on my bed. I haven't been able to lie on it in three weeks. I'm talking right now. And I've had to go deep, 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 deep into why I can't lie on my bed. It's not pretty stuff. It doesn't flatter me. But I have to go there to be able to bring this body into a place where it will allow a sheet to touch it without having pain. So as I said, I'm not somebody who self-aggrandizes herself, but I will say that that is my strength. I know how to get deep into the stuff that may not be pretty, it may not be flattering, but the tissue is storing it. And I have to put kudos to my husband here because he has made, created so much space for that to happen. Quick story that illustrates this. One time I was working very deeply in the tissue to help myself release my own terror. And the rage started to come up. And we know wherever there's terror, there's rage. It has to be in the tissue or the person would have died or gone crazy. And I went into Corey and I was clearly quite out of my body. And I said, Corey, I, I want to buy a gun. This is how I spoke. I, I want to buy a gun, Corey. I want to buy a machine gun. He said, hon, he stayed right with me. He really knew. I said, okay, hon, what do you want to do? What do you, why do you want to buy a gun? Oh, I said, I want to put it out the window. I said, what do you want to do, hon, when the gun's out the window? I said, I want to kill everyone, Corey. I want to kill everyone on this earth. And look, look at what he said. It was brilliant. I said, hon, that is wonderful. It is wonderful that you're letting yourself feel it. 
I said, it is, Corey. It sounds a little bit bad. I don't know if I should feel it. He looked me right in the eye. He said, "Hun, it is so good that you feel this because you've spent your whole life turning the gun on yourself. That was another moment where I came more in because there's always this sense of guilt and shame when you touch the stuff. I mean, I'm not the type of person who's going to buy a gun and kill humanity, but that impulse is in the body. And he was absolutely right. It had been turned against myself my whole life. So long story short, I just want to make two points. The, the gift of the intuition is not really utilized unless there's intimacy. Otherwise, it's just information, blah, 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 blah. It doesn't get the cell to relax. The intimacy is the, the platform upon which the intuition rides. And that is what invites the cell to open. And the final thing, it's not just my going into you have some terror. I feel my strength is I'm able to go into that. You have some terror and you want to kill and this and you feel the shame. And then da, 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 da. I'm able to show the client exactly what is going on unconsciously. Mm. And one thing we know about healing, if we can bring the unconscious to consciousness, mm. then we're on a great platform to heal. So that's what I love about the work. I love that I'm able, for example, a woman will call saying, I want to have a baby I'm IVF, no baby. I'll go in her body and the first thing I'll hear is, I don't want a baby. And that's where the client has to have courage. They can say that's bullshit and hang up, but none of my clients do that. And I go in and I find out why deep in the tissue don't they want the baby. We bring that all to the surface. Every single client that I've said to, that to has her child now. All all of them have written me saying, I wouldn't have my baby without you. Why? Because they were brave enough to look at what the tissue was storing. It's not flattering. It's not what they want to hear, but it's what the tissue is trying to release. I know that's a long-winded answer, but it covers kind of the main things that I work on, that I operate on, so to speak, when I work with someone. I love this because I think one of the questions I wanted to ask you was about, you know, what do you see as the challenges in the healing industry these days? And I think you just answered it because, you know, that, well, what you're talking about, intimacy, I mean, that is also kindness, right? Like it has, it comes with kindness. You cannot be present with another and experience intimacy without kindness, without an open heart, without the information, the, the, the awareness, running through the heart and being out there in, in acceptance but it cannot come from ideas of what that means i mean we're so i find it always so amazing that we are so sensitive you know whether we like it or believe it but we are really so finely tuned to each other's energy and we can read it on a subconscious level. We can read each other's energy straight away. Absolutely. You know, do we like this person or we not like that person? Or do I feel good? Or, and most of the time in this society, we have trained ourselves to override that first intuitive response. So we override it, we dismiss it, we push it away and we make ourselves wrong in that process, right? And I guess that is my second question that popped up listening to you speak right now, because you're talking about rage, you're talking about all these different energies that we can keep inside that are not flattering, like you say. And the question is, why do they, why do they end up in our system in the first place? Where do they come from? What, what, you know? Well, I, I think we could answer it very simply. We never learn, and even to this day, and it's a pain of my life that we don't teach children how to feel and release pain. Right. The body-mind is structured, <clears throat> excuse me, through the breath to feel it. Oh, I'm so scared. <sighs> oh, breathe it in and breathe it out. The body-mind is absolutely structured to feel it and release it. Mm -hmm. That should be a core part of any curriculum of any school anywhere on this earth. How do you feel it? How do you release it? giving people emotional intelligence by teaching them how to work with their pain. Right. That not existing, 
we have countless examples where people are traumatized and let's let's define trauma so the listeners are we're all on the same page trauma is said to be a moment when the body mind is overwhelmed by the stimulation the stimulus coming at it and doesn't have the resources to cope then we have to throw in the concept of sensitivity. We can take person A and have a hurricane coming at them. We can take person B, hurricane coming at them, and we have different responses completely. Person A goes, oh, family, we all better get into the hurricane shelter. Let's come downstairs and play cards while it's happening. Person B can literally leave her body in terror. So the stimulus doesn't define the terror response, the traumatic response, what defines it, what, sorry, what uh, it's contingent upon is the level of sensitivity to the stressor. Right. So that overwhelming response causes the, in the trauma, causes the body to go, <gasps> terror, wherever there's terror, there's no, don't do this. The rage is there and the sorrow, of course, is behind that. All of that, if there isn't a person there able to help that person get into and feel and release all that, it locks in the body. And that's why the most one of the most famous books about trauma and healing is called The Body Keeps the Score. Yeah. And just to finish it, we were talking before we began the conversation, the recorded conversation about forgiveness and compassion. I've had so many clients over the years, they've read books that say that they should forgive. And they come in and they'll tell me about a horrific thing that's happened to them. And they'll say, it's no problem. I've forgiven him. Yeah. And I go in the body. They're ready to kill the guy. Right. <laughs> I said, you're ready to kill him. They start, Am I? I said, yes. I said, the first thing we got to do is let the rage be there. Before you read a book that says forgive, the first step is to feel and release the pain before you jump into forgiveness in other words separate yourself from the offender put it over there and then focus on the healing of the wound so that forgiveness is genuine not just something imposed from the head down yeah so that's what happens the body locks it all in and that's why we know so much about the power of the first responder if you take a child that's been in an earthquake and his mom and dad have died and he has watched that we have tremendous trauma happening in that body. But if you get a first responder right there, holding the child, nourishing the child with love and saying, keep, keep crying, it's okay, you can cry. We can mitigate that trauma response enormously if we get in quickly. The problem is most of us who've had trauma have never had anyone next to us to help us. Right, because oftentimes trauma comes to us not in form of earthquakes right like mm -hmm. something as or, or the war in ukraine right now i mean that's very tangible wow overwhelming experiences to people right now but we get traumatized almost on a daily basis in 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 many ways in many i mean they call it micro traumas right micro trauma and and i guess what where what we want to talk about as well is the work that you're doing in pre-birth communication and with babies and can you share a little bit about your own story of being in utero because i think that shows where, where, where the origins of trauma can be i will but i feel i've left your reader short a little bit so i just add one thing to the feeling releasing yes that's the concept of feeling release absolutely but thank goodness today we have a host of modalities tools that people can use to turn around the trauma response very quickly. Example, we can use Dr. Uh, Zach Bush's grounding technique, left hand for your, oh, I don't know if they're seeing this, left hand on right shoulder, right hand on left shoulder, and wait, and you will feel nine times out of 10, I don't think I've ever had a client, maybe once, not feel this, the energy goes down to the lungs. So you start to feel overwhelmed like that. You can even imagine it. If you can't do it, you can imagine it. Then we have the whole movement, the Havening movement, which was developed by two doctors, brothers, brothers, mm -hmm. where you work with places in the body, like your arms or your face, to bring about 
relax the relaxation response. Then we have a little essential oil. You can carry a little essential oil ro roller ball, ball with you with lavender and some of the other ones. You start to feel, oh, you just roll it on. We have emotional freedom technique. I have learned over the years not to care what people think because environmental illness, you have to forget because you're wearing masks and you're looking weird all the time. So I've trained myself. I don't, I don't care what I do. If it helps me get well, I do it as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. So when I take my walk each day, I do my tapping, even though I'm scared, even though I'm scared. I mean, people look at me, but I don't care. And I tap. So we have emotional freedom technique. We have all the tapping spin-offs that came from EFT. We have the havening. We have Zach Bush. We have essential oil. There are so many things people can have in their toolbox to use in a moment's notice, not to mention, of course, the tried and true rescue remedy developed by Edward Bach in the 1930s. I always have it with me. I make sure my husband has it with me. So I want to make sure your readers know, yes, the concept is feel and release, and we want to get good at that, but there's a lot of things can, that can help the body release that ideally we would have in our toolbox and use whenever we need them. Right. So what you're saying is that there are ways of regulating the nervous system that doesn't necessarily always include or involve a big cathartic scream against the pillow. <laughs> or, 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 time with a, or time with a therapist. Right. You, know, you, you right. can be much more autonomous and just get used to flipping it back into a calm nervous system. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's a perfect lead into the last, your last question. I was the living example of a non-calm nervous system before birth. Wow. This was not because my mother didn't want me. It was the opposite. She wanted me too much. Um, she couldn't have children for five years. She really wanted children. She went on a pilgrimage, came back. They said there was one more thing they could try, but she already had the adoption papers into New York. They were ready to adopt. They tried the other thing. She conceived. It was 1950. They told her that to be, make sure nothing happened, she should rest in bed the whole pregnancy, smoke as much as she wanted to stay relaxed, and she loved to smoke. They all did in the 50s. They all smoked and have a couple of stiff drinks at night. My mother wasn't even a drinker, really. I mean, she might have a glass of wine once in a while, but I mean, stiff drinks meant, you know, martinis, gin and tonic. And um, I, I honestly don't know how I'm alive, but it explains my allergies because I was allergic. I, wouldn't, I couldn't handle breast milk. I mean, I was quite a mess when I was born. But the real issue was my mother's fear. I asked her to go, my mother's very smart. I asked her to go into therapy to, to help understand this. And she said it very clearly. Whenever I felt you move, I thought it meant I was going to lose you. So I tightened up. So my body got the message that when you move, you could die. And when you hold still, then you're okay. There's the freeze. The freeze is I hold still. And of course, that's deeply in your tissue, the contraction of, <laughs> it's too scary, when, and movement is life. Absolutely. And that's shown itself, your readers, your listeners might enjoy this, from 27 till today, I'm still working on it, I still have hope before I die, I'll get through it. But it's been a many decade journey, I can't say I feel good. I can't say, oh, my throat is good. Or my back is good. I can't say it. I get the pain back within five minutes because the wires are crossed. <laughs> if I feel good, I'm alive. I'm expanding. My brain remembers you could be killed. And I pull back. I've tried very, very hard. My husband's tried very, very hard. We still haven't gotten through it, but we're close. We're very close. We believe we're close now. But it shows you how severe um, the freeze can be my brain registers feeling good as being bad. But I was very lucky. I had a therapist who was one of the pioneers of pre-birth therapy. His name is Dr. Graham Farrant. He was a psychiatrist, but no drugs. He just worked with people like me. And he looked at me one day and he said something that he told me he'd never said to anybody else. He said, you have to accept this. You died before you were born. I said, 
do you say this to a lot of people? He said, no, you died before you were born. But after I kind of resisted the, what, why, why does he have to say this to me? It sounds weird. Then after that, I got, it's true. And that's why to this day, if I say I feel good, I pull back because my body knew the only way to survive was to die for a few seconds. And so my journey has been to come out of that profound refusal of life. And of course, the bubble was perfect because it's nine. And, and by the way, I got out of the bubble nine months to the day that I went in. And I said at the time, it was before I saw Graham Farron, I said to my friends, don't you think it's pretty weird that I was in the bubble the same time of pregnancy? And they all said, yeah, that's fascinating. We didn't have any idea. At all. But it was true. It was nine months of complete lack of stimulus for me to be able to see how terrifying it was of life. So yes, this happens in utero. It, and the problem is, if the child is super sensitive, the child can have that response even if there isn't much going on from the mother. Conversely, we have, I have so many stories. I'm writing a book about these baby stories because they're so, I love these stories. But conversely, we can have a child who's experiencing extreme trauma and she's fine. So once again, I make that point about the sensitivity. That determines a lot. I want to make sure your listeners get, have an example of that. A client of mine called me. She was seven months pregnant. She said, I'm scared my baby's a wreck inside. I said, why, why do you sense that? She said, because after I found out I was pregnant, I did that at-home test. I went outside to tell my partner he was in the garden and he didn't know I was doing the test and I tripped over him. He committed suicide five minutes before. So he was committing suicide while she was doing the test. Oof. Yeah, I know. That's really shocking. And I was scared because I've done enough readings for babies and believe me, it doesn't take that much for a baby to get traumatized. And I thought, oh my God, this child's going to be schizophrenic. This is going to be pretty heavy duty. I got to be ready. I got to say this calmly to the mother. I was all set. I got in there. I see this round ball smiling at me, happy as a lark. Like there's no trauma. She's fine. And I said, to, and the mother said, she can't be fine. She said, I've been throwing plates. I say, I hate them. <laughs> Everything you could think of that you would do. I've been crying for two days. Blah, blah, blah. I said, she's fine. And then she stopped and she said, you know what? A few times during the pregnancy, I thought she's fine, but I couldn't believe it. My brain kept saying she can't be fine. I said, she's fine. She's like a sumo wrestler. She's round. Her face is super round. She's smiling. I said, frankly, she's a phoenix rising out of the ashes. Anyway, I got the message after she was born. I'm naming her. It makes me cry. She said, I'm naming her phoenix in honor of the reading because you helped me believe that it was possible that she was okay. And then I got updates. I got the photo when she was three, exactly like I saw the big round face. She had two little boys next to her and she looked like the queen. She had her hands on them, kind of not pushing them down, but like, I'm the queen, you're my subjects. She said, nothing bothers her at all, nothing. She rarely cried. So there's an example where someone comes in so, so resilient and so robust. But then since you asked about the babies, I'll give the opposite. One time I went into a baby's body and he had holding his ears. Obviously he doesn't want to hear something. So I said to the mother, uh, do you have construction going on in the house? No, around the house, in the house. No, no construction. I said, you don't play heavy metal, do you? No, no, we don't play heavy metal. I said, well, he's, he's, he's something, he doesn't want to hear something. And she went, oh. I said, what is it? She said, it's my husband's voice. It's so loud that I feel shaken by it. She said, she said, he's not angry. He just comes in and I don't want to scare your audience, but he screams, hello. <laughs> he's just really a loud guy. And I said, okay. And I said, does he say anything about the baby at all that I might? And she said, well, now that you think of it, he says things like, I'm really happy we're having a child, but I don't want it to stop our social life. We're still going to go to parties, aren't we? And he says this in a super loud voice. 
So I have this little boy holding his ears. So I said to the mother, could you um, talk to the father about all this? And I mean, these are my suggestions, see how he feels. And, uh, and he said, and I said, would you please tell him to please not say again that um, he's happy to have a child, but don't say the but part, just say he's happy to have a child and mean it and feel it. And so two weeks later, I came back, the child's uh, hands were off his ears, he was smiling. The mother said, this was a good moment for me. I'm kind of scared of him. He's so strong. His energy's not mean, but he's strong. She said, I sat him down. I told him a thing or two. He's completely changed. It's been really good for me. The child was fine. The child was born at home. No problem. Everything fine. So there's the sensitivity. If you put Phoenix in that situation, she'd probably be playing a banjo. And if you put little, I think it was Austin, if you put him in Phoenix situation, we would have had severe trauma. Wow, that's just, I just find it so fascinating, you know, wow. But I guess the question I have is, I guess it depends on the soul that incarnates on how sensitive someone is. Well, you know, the minute I start talking about soul, I think, oh, that's out of my Bailey book. Uh, Bailey book. I'm not a spiritual teacher. I just work to help people decontract, open, so they can be more present and feel and receive love. So I get a little nervous when, because I, I don't know, all I can say is that when I'm in a body, that body can, let's say we have this stimulus, go away. We can have some bodies go <gasps> and pull way back. And we have other bodies just go, okay, I'll go away. No problem. How they come in, I suspect you're right. I suspect it has to do with the soul and its reincarnation. I suspect you're absolutely right. But fortunately, my job, my clients are less interested in why, they're more interested in how do I get my child to decontract. So fortunately, I don't have to try to explain it all. But I did have an experience about a year and a half ago that really showed me a lot. It was a, about nine, 10 months, she should have been trying to call, she should be able to be on her abdomen. No, you put her on her abdomen, absolute screaming. So the mother had been a regular client of mine. So I said, I'll try. I have no idea, but I'll try. So I went to the child's body. She showed me nothing. I said, I don't know if I'm going to get anywhere with this. Then I had a flash. I said, let me just go each month in pregnancy. Let me ask her, show me what it was like month one. Show me like, I said, maybe we'll find something. So we went month month, month, month one to month five, nothing. I said to my client, I'll make up a name, Joanna. I don't think I'm getting anywhere, but I'll keep going to month nine. I got to month, month six. And I went, oh! all of a sudden, the image of warfare, guns, fighting, blood. I just went, oh my God. I said, I know nothing like this happened while you were pregnant. I know. I, I said, we must be picking up a past life that she's remembered. And I said, let's cross fingers. We don't know. I got the photo the next day. She was on her abdomen trying to crawl. Mm. So I stay in mystery. I have no idea what lifetime, why she flashed on it, but she clearly got frightened. And there was something about lying down rather than being able to see everything that threatened her. And the minute she would go down, she, she was less able to visualize everything, see everything, and it scared her. But the day after I had the photo, she's down with her head right on the rug, trying to inch along. So I'll comment on that because it clearly shows that we don't just come in here. We come in having lived before. I mean, I love this just because I've experienced it on my own body, right? The ability well, of intuition of literally going beyond a con conscious perception, you know? Uh, cognitive abilities and to feel deeper into yeah into the levels of soul into the levels of the subconscious the cellular memories in the body but I'm just wondering like how would you explain this to someone who is completely new to it and maybe a bit skeptical I mean I remember I tried to give my brother who had a child a year ago a, a session with you and he was completely a no and almost just laughed at like 
what someone telling me they can communicate with my baby in utero that's just for many people so out of this world like is there anything that you can say about that yes yes i can your brother's response is not unusual not unusual particularly around with men mm. with men very important that we highlight until the mid 70s it was presumed a baby even after birth had no feelings circumcisions were done routine minor operations like super, super circumcisions were done without anesthetic 1970s absolutely true one of the biggest pioneers in the field david chamberlain talks passionately about it you can see almost a tear in his eye how he got into this uh, because he was hypno he was doing hypnotherapy with his clients and they were remembering experiences in birth and after and it was absolutely assumed the baby doesn't feel after birth and of course not before they're just a blob they have no sentience they have no feeling probably what changed it was the book the secret life of the unborn child Thomas Verney has been translated into probably about, I could say 33, but let's be say 28 languages, documenting with science that babies in utero absolutely feel, they absolutely know what's going on, they have a connection to their parents. I mean, absolutely. Then Thomas Verney started the Association of Pre and Perinatal Psychology. Now we have people all over the globe, all over the globe with their PhDs in pre and perinatal psychology, doing very, very avant-garde work to undo the tendency to A, view the baby as a blob, and B, make sure that baby comes in okay. For example, we know that those who are victims of abortion attempts, we know they carry a lot of stuff in their bodies. So if we can get to a mother who has tried to abort the child, who is willing to admit that, we can work with the baby and the mother to undo all that so the child doesn't have to live their whole life like that. So there's tremendous work being done. Your brother, like a lot of people, just isn't aware of what's being done. For me, I don't have any problem because the women that call me, they just have one thing on their mind. It's just, I want my baby to be as healthy and happy as possible. That's it. That's it for them. And this is just, an, okay, they're taking their prenatal vitamins. They're doing their yoga. They're, they're doing all their stuff. This is just another part of that prenatal experience. Right. I guess it's not that far-fetched when you consider that, like you say, your own experience from the 50s, you know, or just lie in bed all all the whole pregnancy smoke and drink i mean any doctor suggesting that to a woman <laughs> he'd get fired straight away oh today it's, it's the opposite my mother would have been told to do pilates do gentle yoga go for light swims it would have been uh, throw out the cigarettes and don't look at wine or whatever the poor thing had to drink i mean it's absolutely the opposite so we have to we see prenatal care is changing but we have to remember it was only the mid-70s when somebody started to write babies feel don't do a circumcision i my sister is a tennist and there was a time where she got this i don't know what it was called fellowship or something and it meant she was in a hospital being like a doctor don't ask me why a dentist is like a doctor but anyway the point of the story is i love operations i love blood and all that stuff so she said to me you want to come down and see some operations i said yeah i'd love to i'll come and see operations and uh the only problem was she didn't tell me that she told everybody I was a doctor. She didn't tell me that part. So I'm dressed up and the whole hospital is referring to me as a medical doctor. Worst experience of my life. Anyway, I watched a lot of operations and I watched a circumcision done without any anesthetic. Now this would have been 1985 or six circumcision i watched the little boy no anesthetic given and he was screaming so it shows you that people like your brother who are skeptical it's because it hasn't been around that the baby feels your brother would absolutely know not to 
do a circumcision without an anesthetic. That part he would know, absolutely. It's just going another, another step to say they feel even before they're born. It's just taking that one step for, wouldn't they feel before they're born? And the reason why, I should explain the reason, the reason why people tend to go, oh, that's not possible, is because the brain is not developed. That is true. The brain is not developed. That was the logic for not giving an anesthetic. Oh, the brain isn't developed, therefore the child can't feel. Mm -mm. There absolutely are receptors in the body capable of feeling emotional and sensory that are not dependent on a developed brain. And that's what we know now. And that's why the whole field of pre and perinatal psychology is blossoming all over the earth. They feel, they feel and they know. I'm just trying to think there's so many I, I would like to tell one story because it's so do you mind if I tell one story that illustrates this okay I got a call from a midwife uh, about 15 years ago and she said the obstetrician and she wanted me to connect with a baby the baby was dying in utero the baby was absolutely going to die they weren't waiting for a miracle. The baby should have been dead at five months. The baby was still alive. Every single day the baby survived meant more risk to the mother. My job, and they really presented it quite bluntly, please find out why the baby won't die because we need the baby to die. It was presented just like that to me. The mother called me. She showed absolutely no emotion. She just said, yes, the doctor wants me to have this. Let's do it completely calm. I remember saying to myself, my God, I'd be nervous. I'd be crying my eyes out. I'd be, I'd be emotional, you know, no, no emotion whatsoever. Nothing. It was just as if she was buying an apple and a banana for me, nothing. So I go into the child's body and the body's baby is screaming. I've been trying to tell her. I've been trying to tell her. I've been trying to tell her. By the way, I know nothing about the woman. She doesn't tell me anything about her. The baby's screaming. I've been trying to tell her. She won't listen to me. She's filled with anxiety. She runs around and doesn't finish anything. She has no confidence. She's not finishing her mission, fulfilling her mission on earth. The child is blasting the mother. So of course, I'm in a, 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 a little bit of an awkward situation here. The mother is completely calm, showing me the exact opposite of what the daughter, Phoebe, is telling me. And she's the type of woman that could say, I'm sorry, I don't believe it, and hang up. So this is where intimacy comes in. If I blast out that information, she would have hung up. She would have. It's too much. But my job is to convey to her that you are loved. No matter what your child is saying, no matter how true or not true it is, someone's with you. Someone's with you now. So I spoke very softly, very measured. Phoebe is saying, no quick talking like I usually talk, just very slowly. And she didn't say anything. At least two minutes, nothing. I didn't know if she was going to hang up. I had no idea. And then I heard this. I thought, oh, good, that's a good sign. And she said, I am a master of illusion. I give the impression that I'm calm and I'm confident. She lived, I live in a state of constant inner anxiety and turmoil. I never finish anything I start. And I have no idea why I'm on this earth. Now I knew it took every bit of courage for her to say that stuff. And I knew my job was to get off the phone quickly, not put her through any degree of analysis of this. Let her be with her daughter. So I said, well, I think right now Phoebe just wants to be with you. Is it okay if I leave and you just be with Phoebe? She just said, yes. She didn't say thank you, nothing, just yes. I ended the call, crossed my fingers, and I got the email 
12 hours later, I think it was the next morning, it was about 12 hours. I don't know if it was that night or the next morning, Phoebe died. And we thank you very much. Never heard from the woman again until three months later. Again, very, very sparse words. Marianne, I just want you to know that Phoebe didn't die in vain. I know what my mission on earth is, and I am fulfilling it. Thank you. Wow, that makes me teary. Yeah. So there's the profundity. We have something like a death of a child. There isn't much more overwhelming than the death of a child. And we have through communication, we have intimacy between the child and the mother so that the mother can say, I love my child and she isn't dying in vain. I mean, that is profound. And we thank Thomas Burney and all the others that have followed him who have said, it doesn't matter what's going on in that child's brain, that child feels and knows through the energetic connection, not the material connection, the energetic connection. I feel like we could have a whole other hour conversation leading from now from here to talking about, you know, who are we? Like, what is a human being? What? Because that's the questions that come up. What is life? What is death? What, who, you know, I know that a lot of people have um, a, a bad feeling about death right like i mean bad as in a judgment death mm -hmm. is bad mm -hmm. you know and many people question about what happens to us after death is there a life after death you know like we can just go into that kind of conversation from here like what is the soul who are we what are we meant to what are we meant to do on the planet But I, I almost feel like that would be almost overwhelming because it, it would open a whole other kettle of fish. But well, I think I think I can comment just briefly. I mean, in a sense, we, we are here to just expand to God knows where. And every lifetime, ideally, would be more and more expansion to God knows where. Um, and so for someone like me who started like that, expansion means that when someone looks at me and praises me, instead of going robotic and saying, thank you very much, I'm actually able to feel something, which is a huge breakthrough for me. You know, I'm 71, it's just happening now, I can't believe it. But for somebody else who wasn't as traumatized, um, the, the realm of expansion will be, the expansion will happen in a different realm. They won't have to struggle so much with feeling they're good, worthy of being alive someone else, you'll see the expansion in another realm. But it's basically moving from contraction to expansion in any moment and all through life and even through death. I've been with clients when they've died and I've been able to stay intuitively right with them and tell them exactly what the body was bringing to the surface for them to release so that the death became joyous because it was just continued expansion. It felt good. The physical body was going, but the uh, attention was continuing to expand. To me, that's it. You know, and, and it can be right down to the moment when you get uptight. Oh, why didn't that person do what they say? Another opportunity to expand. Feel the anger, release it, do some tapping. There are tons of tons of ways we can interject that impulse to grow into daily life and interject it into the big moments of life, obviously including death. So one of my questions I had for you is about what you're passionate about and <laughs> what you're working, <laughs> what projects you're working on currently. And I guess you answered a lot of it, but maybe you can speak about, you know, um, yeah, the, the projects that you are working on. Well, that's the good news about my body mind. I came in with a lot of passion. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I'm very lucky that way because I could have given up along the way. But even in the bet bubble, I was always saying to myself, when I get out, I'm going to teach this stuff to people. <laughs> you know? 
I mean, seriously, it was, and even my doctor called me and said, could you have little groups of environmentally ill people in your room? I promise you they won't wear any perfume. So I was teaching, you know, don't use glyphosate, blah, blah, blah. So I came in with a lot of passion. Before I finish my time on this earth, I'd like to lie in bed knowing that I've helped a lot of babies not go through what I've been through. So I would like to quickly, you know, I would like to get in. I can spot it right away when I'm in the baby's body. The first sign is the energy isn't in the legs. They're just not coming down. And, you know, sometimes it's the mother. Sometimes they're just overwhelmed by life. They're picking up. They're like, whoa, what, what is this? Why am I leaving that place to come here? So I'd love to get to them. And I, that's one project. And I'd love to then help children come in fully in body. My second project is I want to work with women who didn't have a strong connection with their mothers. That's very exciting. I had one client call. She said, I will not look at my abdomen. I will not touch it. My husband asked me to, but I can't. I don't want to notice this. You know, like, oh my God, this is where we want to intervene right now. And we did, and it turned around. Now that was very, very gratifying. So I'd like to do a special project called Breaking the Chain. I'd like to find 10 women. I do a questionnaire. We talk about what, find out what happened in utero to them. And we break the chain with their children. Then I'd like to do powerful intentions for embodiment. I love the work of Lynn McTaggart as you do, Kaja. And I've been running these powerful intention groups for four years. <clears throat> They're entirely complimentary. People participate from all over the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the concept is a small group focuses their loving attention on the intention of one member at a time to help bring that intention into life to manifest. I would love to do that for people like me. Why? Because I've been through just about every therapy on the earth. And I've married a somatic psychologist who's written two books about the freeze. And I'm still working hard to come in. So I think one thing that hasn't been attempted, which could be super powerful, is you get a group of people around you who are feeding you with love. And then you ask the client to begin to feel their feet and to move their arm and see if they can feel it. And if they have some fear, well, I can help them get through it. I just think the power of group loving intention could be a major, major factor in helping someone who's like me come in. Uh, so those are three projects. And then of course I'm writing the book about babies because I feel before I leave this earth, I want people like your brother to be able to pick up a book and go, gosh, you know, there may be something to this. We always think everything has to be material, but, you know, I know I can love someone far away. They don't have to be in front of me. Just give them a little examples of the energetic connection. And someone like your brother might say, I get it now. I get it. Not to mention, mention the science, mm. mention the science we have now that shows us the baby can cry in utero, move back from an amniocentesis needle. We know they feel in utero. So I, I'm hoping the series of my books, I, I'm doing a series of books can bring that awareness more and more into the world. And I feel I have an advantage. I don't mean advantage and I'm trying to be better. I don't mean it that way. But a scientist is talking about a scientific study, but I'm inside the baby's body. And I have a mother like Phoebe's mother corroborate everything Phoebe says. And I don't even know the mother. I know nothing about her. That is compelling. That is compelling. And the little baby with the ears, I don't know anything. And the mother said, oh! and she gets it. And that child then starts to connect with his father more. So I'm hoping those stories push this just a little bit more into everyday life. Well, you know, I'm so grateful that you're doing this work because on one hand, I see the world moving towards science, science, science. You know, it's all, I, if it's scientifically proven, then it's valid. On the other hand, I also see the exact opposite, literally people waking up to the fact that science is not the only thing that can give us answers to the mystery of life, right? Absolutely. And 
M science has um, makes mistakes like we you know like your example 50 years ago 70 years ago when you were born i mean that was doctors telling you or telling your mother to smoke so who knows where we will be in the last 70 years but i just am so very grateful that you have come to this planet this earth and have gone through this horrendous experience that you've gone through uh, survived and honed your skill and your gift so you can you can help others and bring that message and that awareness so yes that we all co-create a, a world that's less traumatized that thank you people... thank you for it's so validating for me because as you can imagine when you live your life as different as i do you know reacting to this reacting to this can't eat this you form a an image of yourself that there's something wrong with you you know you're not normal you're really not normal if you're in a bubble and so i've labored under that sense well you know who am i what do i really have to give i'm so i'm you know i'm so weird <laughs> and so having an opportunity to share helps me strengthen my sense sense of self-worth yes i am weird and i yes i do have to be careful in a way other people don't but that doesn't mean i don't have something to give so thank you for strengthening that sense in me. It's my pleasure. It's, um, I'm just incredibly gra grateful I've met you in my life because you have played uh, yeah, a very profound role in my own healing journey. And I know that anyone lucky enough getting in touch with you and working with you will probably have the same mm -hmm. um, yeah, gift of healing and, so and babies as well. So Marianne, is there anything else as we close? No, I just want to say I love you. I'm so glad you came to that class I caught, taught 20 years ago. Listeners, I want to tell you, she sat in that class looking just as beautiful and alive and radiant as she is now. I couldn't take my eyes off her. She's exact. I mean, I know she's grown, but oh my God, the essence of Kaja was right in that class. And I'm so, so happy that we've stayed in touch for 20 years. And the other thing is, I have to say it. If anybody knows anywhere that I can teach anything, call me up. I don't want money or anything. I love teaching. I love it. And now I sit in front of this computer one-to-one, -one, but if I have a chance to do anything with a group and teach, I would love it. Because that's one thing you know about me. I love to be in front of a group and teaching and inviting people to consider new ideas. I definitely remember you as a teacher in that in that classroom back in Australia all those years ago. She was on fire. I was on fire and the class would end and I didn't want to leave. I'm like, why do they have to go? Can't they stay here and talk more? <laughs> so Marianne, you have a website that I will put in the link underneath. Yes. And that's the best way to contact you is for your website with your email. If anyone wants to be part of the well, the free projects that you're working on, the one-on-one mm -hmm. -on -one sessions. I someone's pregnant, a woman who has, who's working on healing their relationship with their mother. And of course, if anyone needs support for powerful intentions, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm, I'm very good with email. I, I do get back to people within two days. Everyone who, anyone who might write will get an answer. Fantastic. Thank you so, so Thank much. Thank you, my dear. I loved it. Yeah. Have a beautiful day. And I thank you. Stop the recording.